there was um, an AI voice of Scarlett Johansson, and they created an ad. The company created an ad, and it sounded just like Scarlett Johansson. Oh. And yeah, and it wasn't her. But yeah. this AI, this bot, whipped up we a voice created. that sounded just like her. Right. And it's like, what? Now she can she can be our GPS navigation? Like, what does this mean? We are the Get Realisms Podcast. I am Adam Chase Ray. And I am Christine Chin. And surprise, we're both filmmakers. We get into it by sharing secrets, advice, and gossip in filmmaking. And we even get our other filmmaking friends to share theirs too. So please, everybody, join us for an, an ode, ode to, to filmmaking. filmmaking. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are back again. Uh, episode 149 now. We're moving on to episode 149 of the Get Reels podcast. I am Adam Chase Rennie. And I am Christine Chen. And today we have a special guest who is also a dear friend of mine. Jordan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Who are you, girl? Hi. Uh, my name is Jordan Aquino. I am an actress, an occasional filmmaker, and... Uh, an acting coach. I do audition coaching as well. Um, my most notable credits are Better Call Saul, it was an Army of the Dead. Um, I did an A24 film a few years ago called When You Finish Saving the World. It's Jesse Eisenberg's directorial debut, which was really cool to be a part of. Um, oh, and oh, I'm on The Cleaning Lady. I did I did some episodes of The Cleaning Lady. Who? Uh, one thing that I love about Jordan is that her career path like kind of mirrors mine a little bit in terms of we both just moved from places that we loved very much and had very successful careers and to come to this God for place called LA. <laughs> we were just As talking tell, mad so shit much. about LA the last episode. So, you know, we can air our grievances if, if, if you like, Jordan. <laughs> sure. Sure. We can discuss. So, <laughs> right. Yes, we will discuss. And this year, I was the cleaning lady. I love the cleaning lady. Oh, good. Yes, yes, yes. So we've already got fans. Jordan's got fans. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, I guess one of the questions I had was, what made you decide to move to Los Angeles? What was the, like, the straw or, yeah, and how has it been for you here in Los Angeles? How long have you been here? Well, I I actually lived in LA when I was a teenager, so I was doing the acting thing as a kid. You're not a teenager um, right now. <laughs> God bless. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm still a teenager. Um, I like that. Um, so I was here as a. There's like a bug flying around, and I have a ring light, so it's like it's okay. It's right here. Um, oh, I lived here as a teen, so I had experience in LA and in the industry, but. Um, I was working in New Mexico previously, but I decided to move because I had done really everything I could do in New Mexico. I'd, I've worked there for a long time. Um, a wonderful place to build a resume, an amazing community. It's it's a, obviously a much smaller market. You get to know everyone, casting the other actors. It's but it operates. Um, it has its it has its differences. It's very unique. I'll say that, as you probably know about smaller markets. But um, I decided to move because all of the the projects that I was reading for um, at this point in my career, they were in Atlanta. They were out of L.A. They were out of New York. And I was really fortunate that I was able to do this from my basement in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I had of a team, um, a hodgepodge team of agents in different markets submitting me elsewhere. And I mean, obviously COVID changed everything. So I had access to roles all over the place. Um, but it was, what was really missing for me is I felt that I needed to be here. I needed to be back here. Um, there's obviously like a, a creative undercurrent in this town. Everything's moving really quickly. Um, and the people that I needed to meet are all here. And I think I'd been Drinking the Kool Aid for a while, telling myself, "Well, you can live anywhere," and that's that's if you're a name, that's if you're recognizable. You can live anywhere, um, but if you are developing your career, you need to be in the mecca. You need to be in one of these bigger cities so you can meet like-minded people and people who want to move to the next level. And I find myself kind of isolated and a little bit lonely in New Mexico, just finding peers and finding a way to uh, advance my career. And yeah, this is really long. 
a long explanation of why I moved. No, Basically, I just perfect. wanted to meet other people. You're leveling up. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You're both leveling up. And before mm-hmm. we go on, somebody said that there's some bad echo, and I think it's an IG. Is your phone on top of your computer and your computer? I'm just trying to see. It is. Hold on. Let me see if I can turn my headphones on on the phone, and maybe yeah. that's doing this. Sure. Is that helping? Is or is that making it I can hear you. Yeah, I, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Is there an echo still there? Hopefully not. So, hey, IG folks, if there's a terrible echo, let us know. So we're trying. It's all Jordan's fault. <laughs> it's my fault. Uh, it's better, yes. Okay. Better, we're good. yeah, exactly. Good, good, good. That's tech issues. All good. Um, Well, that is, that's the thing, is you're, in conclusion to what you said, we're leveling up, and LA is the place to level up. Uh, it's hard because I'm sure you're experiencing the same thing, but in New Mexico, you're probably one of the top, like most more successful actors who are working consistently and everything. And same in Austin. I was, uh, was one of the few filmmakers that was working consistently and doing well. Didn't really have to look for a job because word of mouth was so strong because of the network I built there. Same with you. But there comes a point where if you want to just only work on a certain level of projects, sure, you can stay where you are. But if you want to level up and move to the bigger stuff or work, be considered for the lead or whatever, L.A. is still where the decision makers are, right? Is that what you would say from your experience? Yes. Um, yes and no. There are advantages disadvantages just like yeah. anything sure. um, of being in a smaller market especially as an actor um when i came up in, in the new mexico market it was less competitive um now i mean there's so many people who have moved to new mexico and honestly the talent pool in new mexico has been completely infiltrated by every other market and i don't even know if i should use that terminology it's like infiltrated but everyone's lo- working local everywhere like it, it's just it's sort fair. of a free for all. Yeah. So, um, but when I was coming up in the New Mexico market, it was still sort of undiscovered. It was this untapped um, film town, and um, because I was in a smaller pool of talent, um, I was able to essentially jump the line as far as getting my tapes in front of producers. Right. So if like for Army of the Dead, that's a Zack Snyder movie, like he got to see and I auditioned for a completely different role. Um, My tape got to go to Zack Snyder. Had I been in a pool like L.A. with the size of my resume here, I probably would have been, you know, fighting for what they see, like 20 people out of like 5000 submissions. And of that 20, one person gets a job. So. If you're in New Mexico and the pool is smaller um, and and not all tapes go to producers either. So your your chances of even being seen are so slim. So, yes, there was the advantage that I was able to actually get exposure um, with the right casting directors and the right producers. So that way um, the tapes were being seen and I was being considered for work. Um, They also read for roles in L.A. and New Mexico. So you're still competing with this larger market. Mm. So I guess it's, I would say, easier to build a resume in these smaller places. But the disadvantage is you're dealing with these preconceived notions or like sort of this unspoken stigma where I'm sure you've experienced this, Christine, that um, productions coming into town expect very little from locals like you almost don't even want to talk about being local because it's weird it's simultaneously you're held to this really high standard like you better not mess up because you know you're, you're the local girl like of course she's gonna screw this up you know but um when you're good they're like what are you doing here why do you live here you're so good and so it's a it's a very strange experience like yes there are advantages yes it's a smaller pool i don't think that anymore i think like I said, it's been flooded by actors in other places. Um, we're the cats out of the bag. Um, but when I was coming up in the industry, I definitely had an edge because of that. 
I am in the same boat as well. Uh, Austin was the same thing, up and coming place. Now it's flooded because everybody from LA is moving to Austin. Uh, but yeah, okay. so it was easier. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> I mean, they are. No, every yeah, person I, I talk to, it seems like, like we're going to Austin. Um, and so yes, it's a lot harder. But in the very beginning, because it was such a newer market, exactly, it was easier to be seen. You're competing with. 50 other people versus 3,000 other people. But the, you're, I think the biggest thing that you're describing, the stigma, is the issue. It's that, like, I was starting to see producers having resumes, and it would, they would maybe both be about the same level in terms of experience, but because one was local and one was in Los Angeles, they would 100% go with the one in Los Angeles. Because... Oh, LA people, because they live in LA, are just better quality. That that's just the weird the stigma. It, whether it's true, mm, you know, but like that's just it's almost like oh, because you, if you think of it, it's Harvard, Harvard versus community college or something, right? So it's like the best person from community college and the worst person in Harvard. They're certain to pick the worst person from Harvard than the best person from community college because <laughs> of the brand. So yeah, that's just exactly what it is, and. I mean, being here in Los Angeles, what have you, have you seen any evidence of like, ah, I made the right decision or like, I understand that this is where I should be now in your, in your experience, Jordan? Absolutely. I think I've been very fortunate. When I moved here, I moved during, and I was, I was treating it as a sabbatical trip when I first got here. I, I, I just wanted to come here, be on the picket lines, um, check things out, see if I wanted to move back. Because for a long time, I convinced myself, no, I could stay in New Mexico. I can can stay here. I can can create a difference in my community, blah, blah, blah. Um, Get into that later. But when I came here, um, I immediately started making friends with really wonderful, creative, and successful, and kind people. Like, I I'm so grateful. I was really worried that I I wouldn't be able to find that it, it would take a long time for me to find my footing and to find my people. Um, but that to me was the so validating and was an absolute testament to this is this was 100 the right choice. And I I did get some pushback from from quite a few people saying, you know, there's a strike happening. Why are you going to LA? Nobody wants to be in LA. Why would you move to LA during this time? And obviously the industry is in this really strange place right now. There is no normal. I don't think we've had normal since pre-COVID, you know, but um, <laughs> it's normal anymore. But um, a lot of people thought that it was a, a terrible decision. And I definitely was, I thought I was a little bit nuts for doing it too. Me but too. Um, I, I mean, I found you. <laughs> you know, um, I've, I've just had a really lovely experience and I thought coming out here, I would just be a tiny fish in a sea of just an, an enormous sea. Like I, I didn't know if I would be able to make friends or if people would seriously, especially because I built a career, um, from New Mexico. Um, but I found that just in passing, if I if I meet people from the industry or who are in the industry and go, oh, I've worked on this show or that show, they perk up and they're like, oh, oh, you're working. Oh, you you have some credibility. And um, it was weird because moving here, I, I thought, I just didn't know what to expect. And I have found that I'm constantly kind of walking this line of feeling like I know nothing. And then also, oh, wow, I, I have really amassed a body of work and um know quite a bit more and have far more sensibility and insight than I thought I did. So it's kind of. I totally get what you're places. saying. I totally get it. It's just like the the more I know, the less I know, but then I'm also constantly surprised by how much I know. Yeah. <laughs> We got a uh, pretty good comment uh, from True Living. Haven't, str- haven't streaming platforms solved the market factor to a certain extent considering audiences are now global? Um, I feel like that's, a, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting comment because, it, 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 I mean, it's true that, like, you would imagine that with 
I mean, Jesus, how many how many streamers are there now? Like, there's at least uh, uh, twenty <laughs> different streamers. Uh, you would imagine that like the opportunities would be um greater right yeah you would imagine that like there would be so many opportunities for even uh like myself like local texas you know filmmakers and whatnot and it's just i mean again it it all and y'all kind of like already said that in the beginning of the episode where it's like you sort of you sort of have to establish yourself in los angeles in order to even just get your name out there because working local, like you said, Jordan is only just going to like keep you local, you know, until like somebody notices you and are like, you're so great. Why are you here? You know, it's like, well, you know, you just, you got to take, you know, the jobs with what you can get. And you would imagine it would be a lot more, but um, yeah. And really quickly to tag on to the streaming aspect. Yes. In theory, it should create more opportunities, and I think in the long run it will. The issue right now is all these streamers are struggling to figure out how to monetize these this new audience, and and it, that is why we're seeing all these strikes. It's because this is a new medium, this is a new methodology, and it's a new way in which the world is consuming media. Therefore, it's not written into the contracts how to monetize it. So a lot of these studios are getting a free for all almost because there are no contracts saying you have to pay people for the number of views or whatever from this, all this money that they're making from the streaming platforms, you know, and also the streaming platforms themselves haven't figured out how to capture this, these audiences. And so they're also struggling to figure out how they're making money. So it's just, everybody's just trying to figure out like what the fuck is going on. And because of that, it's throwing everything into disarray. And I think once the, if the dust settles from all of these contract negotiations, which it seems like it is supposed to, then we will start to see the benefits of these platforms more. But it's always going to be this tug and pull in any industry, any any environment when you have a new technology and a new way of doing something introduced. I mean, when talkies became a thing in film, it also fucked the industry because people don't know what to do, what to do with it, you know? And so it's just a it's a natural growth stage. We're just in the middle of it for the first time. I mean, not really because digital came and stuff, but digital was pretty fast for people to figure out. But for some reason, this monetizing streaming and stuff as in distribution has just been really difficult for Hollywood to to figure out. And the people who are suffering the most are always the people who actually do the work. So, yes. I also want to comment on this streaming versus uh, doesn't necessarily financially translate at all. My residual sure. payments for jobs that I've had, network paychecks are always so much bigger. Like it is laughable. I could, I don't know if I have any of my residuals here. I'll, I'll get like 96 cents from like different Netflix shows I've done. Um, oh, or, oh shit. Anything. You're um, rich, Jordan. You are so yeah. rich. Ninety six <laughs> cents. If I Sheesh. do something, I know I could go get a whole stack of checks. Like I have, I have to take them out of the bank. It's like a dollar. It's, it's, it's really, really quite pathetic. The the, um, the level we close this crazy is more. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say like the paper that was printed on and the postage was more than the residual that you got from that check. That's so. That's like. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> Truly. It's, it's offensive. Yeah. I'm like, can we not? It's, yeah, it's it's really. And sometimes there's there's residuals that come in. You're like, hey, <laughs> thank you. Um, but that's for like film. Um, for streaming platforms, you, you don't, don't necessarily get a lot. Um, I will right. say exposure wise, like if you have a nice juicy role on netflix right like everybody sees your face like when i did uh army of the dead my instagram was popping off like nothing else i just was getting tagged over and over again because everybody has access to it and i think if you're an actor um that's great because your face uh getting out into the world is what you want 
you know, you want people to see you and to see what you're capable of, but that does not necessarily translate into any kind of financial. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> and also you're also, we're also facing a time. It's not just the streaming aspect. It's the AI aspect as well. And so, yes, your face is out there, but then there's also people who are trying to capture your face for life for very little money so they can reuse it over and over and over again and never pay you a cent, which is really fucked up considering that if you were to watch Black Mirror on Netflix, they literally did an episode on this um, exact problem. Um, It's an episode with Selma Hayek in it. I will not go and spoil the rest of it, but like they're literally writing about this yet. They're doing this to us. Perpetuating it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I I don't know if you can answer. I can't read comments. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. What were you saying? Go ahead. My phone is far away from me. Yeah. True Living also uh, chimed in. I will also recommend more global collaborations with production houses in India, Italy, Spain, Turkey, for example. Yeah. Like a lot of international, uh, uh, productions have been uh, pretty much like popping off. And of course, you know, LA would uh, 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 outsource to those countries to to make those productions. But I wanted to ask you, and maybe you can't answer this question, but like on the topic of AI, um, last year we had the, uh, uh, like we mentioned, the uh, sag after strikes and the writer strikes and and what have you. Do you know like what that deal looked like in terms of AI for actors? Because like I I don't know if like I I haven't read the full fine details of it, but it felt like like there possibly could be like a better agreement for people who are going to utilize AI for actors to use their likeness for per, uh, perpetuity. I I assume is there like any incentive or any any like monetization from that that is like f- fair i guess i'll be completely honest i haven't read yeah um, <laughs> that's fair thoroughly yeah um and i and i should but i remember as we were in the midst of the strike and talking about it with people in my community and looking over the posts that um I would make online and, and trying to stay educated, but also trying not to stress out and be absolutely terrified that sure. I just leaned in really hard to a job that might not exist because of AI. So I, it, it was, it was hard to, to educate myself because I felt so powerless at that point. Um, but I know so many actors that when we reached the agreement, like this is a terrible deal. This is this isn't really? actually going to protect us. But but their thoughts were that, you know, there's no way that the technology will be able like the the deal they put in place protects us long enough that when we have to renegotiate, they don't think the technology will be able to catch up with the threat of AI taking over everything. Right. Um so we'll be fine to renegotiate before three years is up and we can have a better um a better deal that does protect us, but I don't know. This seems like just such a slippery slope and it's really scary. Especially, I mean, I don't know. Did you hear about the Scarlett Johansson voice situation? Like, I've heard of it. I've heard. Um, I, I've heard. Can you elaborate a little bit if you know what it is so that our I, listeners I, I saw a video about it on Instagram um, not long ago, so I, I might butcher that. I will butcher this because I don't know all the details. It's okay. But there was um, an AI voice of Scarlett Johansson, and they created an ad. They created an ad, and it sounded just like Scarlett Johansson. Oh. And yeah, and it wasn't her, but yeah. this AI, this bot, whipped up Equated. a voice that sounded just like her, right. and it's like, what, now she can she can be our GPS navigation? Like, what does this mean? And so <laughs> she was not happy. So um, I will have to follow up on that. I kind of want to look it up right now because I don't want to sound... Yeah, from I just found an article from January 18, 2024 about unpacking SAG AFTRA's new AI regulations, what actors should know on backstage. And what it really sounds like is that they have a consent clause and you just 
you need to be vigilant about reading your contracts and making sure you're not accidentally signing away your rights, essentially, because they because there is this clause, it basically allows them to do whatever if you agree to it. But if you read it and you're like, no, I fucking don't agree with this, then I'm sure there's ways around, like, then you can actually negotiate something that's better for you. But they are required to, to essentially put this clause that says, like, hey, do you consent to us, you know, using an AI to, to replicate you in the future type thing. So What a loaded um, contract. That's yeah, crazy. Exactly. It's like, it says, with your permission... Producers can completely simulate your likeness through AI, which means you won't have to show up on set at all. Blah, Jesus blah. Christ. Um, yes, but the issue is that if you're an AI-generated actor, then you're not protected under SAG because you're AI. So it's so you're not you. You are. That's, a, that's an AI-created thing. So it's just like before you sign anything like this, you just really need to um, re- read your contracts. So. Yeah, and I also want to follow up with uh, True Living. She she commented, or they commented again. Uh, it was Apple that made that ad, which is even more like messed up that they used uh, Scarlett Johansson for AI voice for probably one of the big, the biggest company probably in in terms of technology uh, to to utilize AI without. Uh, I mean, I'd imagine without consent. I don't know how true that is, but um, that is that is uh, terrifying. <laughs> that is yeah. scary. I don't know. It is scary, but it's like with any new technology, there's always going to be this new search for equilibrium again. So I think it's going to be a lot of this, like companies testing the waters and testing the limits of what they can and yeah. do. Well, I think how much can we get away with? Yeah. Right. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah, but yeah, I think you're right, Jordan. Are, I, yeah. I think I think because the technology is just not like it's not incredible right now. Like I mean, you, it's pretty. At least for me, I won't speak for y'all, but at least for me, it's kind of easy to discern like deep fake AI technology and and even AI voice. To be to be honest, like it's like I've heard like a Taylor Swift uh, AI composition of of not like us by uh, Kendrick Lamar, the Drake diss track. And Taylor Swift's voice is in that. And it's just like, it's so, you can absolutely tell. And it's very, um, it's not Uncanny Valley yet. And it's 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 super, like, not 100% there at all. But it, it, just the idea of, like, that contract just being like, yeah, we're going to use your likeness forever. It's like, um... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's uncomfortable. I feel like there should be a better incentive, or maybe like I don't know, like a a a, a contract or a consent something to to get some sort of monetization from it because that is just that is a fucking no no. And clearly, a company like Apple have, I think, plenty of money to to go around. You know, <laughs> right? But I think that's the issue. I think it's just going to be a lot of. Companies acting like kids, testing their parents. Like, what can we get away with oh, yeah, before somebody's totally. like yeah. Charlotte Johansson is like, "Fuck you, I'm going to sue you." You know? Then, oh, whoops, whoops, sorry, we didn't know. Well, you know, here's the money. So it's just like, I think it's going to be a lot of that for a while. I think it's just um, companies seeing, "Hey, are you actually reading your contracts?" You know, and then getting a slap on the wrist in a way and somebody slaps them hard enough where they're going to be like, okay, let's, let's be good. You know, okay. We, we pushed a boundary. These, these are the boundary now. And then you, to a certain extent, and then you finally find an equilibrium where it's like an accepted norm to do a certain, to do things a certain way. You know, right. that's just how it's going to go this for, for a little bit. Yeah. What were you going to say, Jordan? This is just more commentary that being an actor is already such a, disempowered position to be in, to be honest, especially as a woman. Like, there, I mean, that's why I started writing and I produce some of my own work. Um, also why I teach, because I like to educate my students and help them feel um, empowered in their choices and how they go about their career. But it often feels like you're a, a talking prop, especially as a woman. It's like how, 
How long are you relevant? And it's for a long time, it's like women just disappeared on screen from about like 28 to like 70. There's just no women who exist on screen. There, there are no women that are. No, none of those. If, if you are hot, you are on screen or you're decrepit and old and you are ancient and you are grandma. Um, <laughs> but now things are kind of shifting. Sorry, this is, this is a whole other. Track. It is true. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's a tangent. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we're all about yeah. tangents here in the Get Roses podcast, Jordan. You go tangent mm-hmm. crazy. Go for it. Oh, oh, yay. My ADHD is just like, <laughs> woo look out. Take it in. Um, but <laughs> the thing that's so scary about AI to me is, can, can my, what are they going to do with my with my likeness? The, the, it's just dance monkey dance. I mean, you're not even there to make a decision about mm-hmm. How they decide to put you in this scene or that scene um saying and, and that was a lot of the the pushback when they were in negotiations is can they add new um new dialogue can they right. can they make you do something that you didn't sign up to do and that is really scary when you already have so little control mm-hmm. as an actor at the end of the day even if you, if you get the job the only control you have is when they 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 roll and then they say cut that that little space of your performance and then editing you don't know what they're going to do with it no idea and so to just feel as if there is the possibility that you're this imaginary robot you they Mm -hmm. have the rights to they're going to do with it if it if they're just going to go off script like that's that's so scary especially adr that's my whole thought yeah, now. especially ADR, I feel like that's like you're you're really um, <laughs> you're really pushing the limits when when it comes to like, uh, oh, do we need to bring this person in and pay them for this one line? I guess not. I guess we can just uh, fucking, you know, use use AI. I, it's just yeah, I don't know. I, I just feel like the this whole world and maybe you're right. Maybe I, like by the next time uh, SAG-AFTRA has their renegotiations with their contracts, I'm sure AI might be better, but I mean, it, it, given or not, it doesn't matter. Like you, you should, you should like, they should establish clear boundaries when it comes to, uh, likeness, voice, everything. They're going to get your DNA, <laughs> some shit. I don't know. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> these well, people no, are wild. I think it's, I think it's whenever there is people in the position of power, where the money is coming from, there's always going to be this push and pull until the people from the below rise above to say, no, you can't fucking do that anymore. And it, there, it's going to be continue this push and pull because at the top, they're always going to be testing. They're always going to be pushing the boundaries to see what they can get away with because I get it. It is, we're in a capitalistic society and they owe... Um, a certain margin, certain ROI to their investors. Investors are going to push for making the most bang for your buck. And so they're always going to be testing the waters as to how much they can make stuff for and get away with it, you know, until regulations are put in. And so, and those regulations are also man-made. And so it's going to be a test, a constant test. And there will be more strikes that happen because every, is it three years when contracts expire? There's always a wait time for renegotiation so i bring this up because i love this natural segue into what jordan was saying in terms of empowerment through creating your own work and it's something Mm. that i also teach as well um and i've been building um a online course called in get realisms academy called create your own content that i've been teaching in person uh, a few times in Austin, but it is that idea of the, what you have is your IP. It's, it's whatever comes out of your brain. And especially with actors who don't have much control once they've done their acting for a specific project and stuff, you do have full control over whatever you create and you cast yourself in. And so Jordan, can you speak to, um, yourself creating stuff on your own terms and what you teach at your acting school to your uh, students. Sure. Um, so I haven't 
produced a lot of my own work. I wrote and produced a short film in 2020 called Can't Have It Both Ways. It's a musical, political musical about a Latina who goes and really well, finds out he's a Republican, and then it uh, turns into like a Hamilton-esque uh, type musical. And I, that film for me was a passion project that I did with friends. Um, and then it took on a life of its own. And it was just sort of an offering to just a love letter to my community and everybody that was stuck in their house suffering during COVID. I, um, I didn't make it because I was trying to take my career into my own hands anyway. Um, sure. It was mostly because I just bored by what I was seeing on the news and we were having a plague and a, right. and a dictatorship at the same time. <laughs> so yeah. what do you do? Uh, naturally write a musical about it. Um, and a great name too. So that, Can't have it both ways. That's a phenomenal name. I like it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't know. I put it up on YouTube. I, I produced it with a, with a fabulously talented producer, a friend of mine, put it with um, the song with my composer friend, Robin Holloway, who um, has a political satire theater company and so just teamed up with these amazing creatives. Um, so that was more like a passion project. Um, but then it ended up having a life at festivals. Like I put it on YouTube and it had a, a different name originally. Um, and then we changed the name to the festival thing. Ended up uh, being did at uh, Cinequest, Santa Barbara International Film Festival, Nolly, amongst a few other smaller festivals, and that was well. Um, so I'll, I'll say that that experience was creatively. It was honestly out of everything that I've done in my career. My acting career is very important to me, but that project in particular was so, I am so proud of it. And it's been this calling card for me, that I think sort of represents who I am as a person. Um, and I just send it to people. It's like eight minutes long when I meet new people, if they want to know, oh, what are you just fun? I'm like, here you go, watch my musical. And that, it's been a great conversation starter. And it's cool because it got into these great festivals, which was a pleasant surprise. Um, I guess in some way it gave me, um, it was empowering in the way that I could create something. I didn't know what I was doing when I made that film. Um, and then a lot of people seemed to enjoy it. So I think it was, it was really um, special to me because it was a testament to the power of community. And the only reason that thing came together was because a bunch of talented people agreed to show up and do it. Um, things about film is the collaborative nature of it and how incredible synergy of so many people who agree to show up and, and offer gifts to make something happen. Um, but I don't know that it actually like moved my career forward. I would love to to write, I've written, um, I've co-written a couple of different feature length scripts, but they never went anywhere. They almost went places and then they didn't, which is the story of so many, so yeah. many scripts. But I feel like um, that's just how it is in general in Hollywood is you're throwing spaghetti at a wall and just trying to see what will catch on. But what I can argue with you, because I know you're saying, oh, it didn't go anywhere specifically, but what was the likelihood of you getting casted in a musical, a political musical on your own with any other project? Probably not that high, right? So now some producer can look at your stuff and be like, oh, I can picture her in my musical that happens to be a political satire. And I think the issue I find with a lot of talent is that it's very, as humans, we categorize people, right? We're going to look at somebody and be like, oh, you're a great cheerleader, or you are a nerd, or you are whatever. And it is hard for people to move beyond how they initially categorize people. And so yeah. the actors that I know that create their own content 
what I love is they can put themselves in situations, in scenes that they otherwise would never have been considered for because they give off some sort of stereotype. Just just literally because of how they're grown, you know, what they look like. But, and most, pre- many people are not imaginative enough to look beyond those stereotypes, you know? And so by showing and having materials that show, look at me, I am a spy, or look at me, I am a, yes, political satire, musical genius, you know? I now, as a producer who knows nothing about you, can now expand the box of what I see your potential to be. And I think Mm -hmm. that is the power of why being able to create your own stuff is important. You know, I think that's true. I think that's definitely true. Um, I totally bypass that point. Yeah, it's absolutely makes such a good point. Because I think we are typecast uh, very easily. Like for me, I, I play a distressed influencer very well. I cry really easily. So I I've been a young, distressed mother many times. Um, and I would like to break out of, no, actually, like, please pay me to do that. Not a lot of people can do that very well. So, um, I mean, yeah, I, yeah I'll, I'll keep taking those roles. Yeah. <laughs> I think it also, I mean, yes, you know your strengths. And this is more commentary as a coach, as an acting coach, than um, so much an actor or someone who's trying to move things for or creating content or whatever. I think that you as an artist, as an actor, you know what What speaks to you and you know what you can do until you can show someone that, whether that's with a a strategically chosen self tape of a a scene that somebody else has written or from some other show. Great. Or something that you create yourself. Like you can tell people you're talented. You can tell people, oh, I can do this. But unless you can show them, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. There it Um, is. So I. You're absolutely correct. And if you can produce your own work that showcases um, a role that you can really just knock out of the park, it really benefits you. And also, I will say this, I think that creating your own work or your own content, producing your own work, writing your own work, it's, um, this might just be my own insecurity, but I feel that sort of levels the playing field where people take you more seriously as an actor once they know oh you you have have a brain you can come up with story you can contribute in a way that i wasn't giving you credit for before yeah and that's something that's really sort of annoying is i think that people treat actors as though not all people but i think there are quite a few assumptions or generalizations that happen about actors not really having a lot going on upstairs and the best actors are the most intelligent compassionate educated well-read people that i know totally Um, and there's also some there's also some that are maybe not that right maybe not that and they still work and they still work (laughs) and you know love them that's great um that's okay but i think by creating your own work it automatically you put your hat in the ring people see you um as a, as a multifaceted being, you know, who yeah. has something to contribute. Whereas sometimes I think actors, it's like, we just show up on the day and we say the thing and there's not necessarily an understanding of what it is that we're contributing. Cause sometimes you make it look easy, right? Like if you're a good actor and you show up and you do your job, like I think that can go um, notice or it's easy to just to dismiss that. So if you are creating your own content and you are writing your own stuff and you can in and get your hands dirty and and show that you have ideas beyond what you're doing um, for a role that you're playing that you've been cast for. Um, I think there's something that's really exciting about that. And it's, um, I think, really uniting. At least I I think not all the different departments really get to know one another. And that, I think, has been a really wonderful experience for me. to be able to participate in a different creative way and be seen in a different light and connect in a different way. I a hundred percent agree with you on this. And I can speak from being from the producing aspect, why actors get this, you know, this reputation. I think it is when you're very good, exactly what you're saying, you make it look easy. 
And it's a little bit different when you're seeing the grip moving, a, you know, something super heavy or let's operating some giant machinery or the DP clearly going in and like changing the lighting and stuff. And I think an issue is when you are an actor that's only just acted, it's a lot of actors, I'm not saying all, but a lot of actors forget that they are not the most important hog in the machine. And it's all about perspective. When you work with someone who has done everything on a set or something or has an understanding of why every other department is just as important, there is, we operate differently. There's more of a respect for each other in that understanding that this is a very collaborative me medium. Therefore, even if I don't feel like my character would go to that point, I will do it anyway because I know that at that mark, I will be in focus. And I respect what the camera department is doing to get me to that mark because I know they're probably seeing a frame that makes me look the best that I, otherwise I wouldn't know as an actor, right? And the issue that I find with actors that just only act a lot of times is they don't understand why everybody else is just as important to making that scene successful. And so my experience working with actors who have made their own stuff, who have produced their own things, is that they have the perspective to know how difficult everybody else's job is as well. And so there's an appreciation and an ability to stand outside of yourself, outside of your job, and understand everybody else's. And this is not just for actors. This is directors. This is producers. This is everybody. Because I can also say the same thing about a director that only directs or a producer only understands the business aspect and they don't understand how hard it is for the actor to do that scene and cry 50 million times if you've never been in that position either, mm -hmm. right? And so I think with any position, it's a benefit for everybody to have had done, you don't have to do it well, but have had ex had to experience somehow every job, some you know, to an extent that you can appreciate why that job is important and why it takes the time it takes to do certain things and why you should be patient and know that that prop is not going to materialize by itself. You know, so just the all these little things, I think, come with making your own things. And so I often tell any crew, not just actors, any person who wants to work in the industry, that it's essential for them to try producing something once in their life, because then they will realize how hard it is to get the money, how hard it is to get the people and everything. So the next time they're on set and they're complaining that, oh, all the jobs are going internationally uh, because I have to ha work at a certain rate. I'm not willing to negotiate down or whatever they also understand the realities of why that is happening and it's not i don't think there's a right or wrong it's just understanding the realities of something mm. and learning how to work around it or create a different change create a different solution you know i just see a lot of both cast and crew members complaining about things but not offering any solutions or right. being understanding about it, you know? So, yes, I would love to get full rate all the time. I would love that. But I also know being on the other end of a producer who is making a film with no names, I'm not a name, you're just only going to be able to raise a certain amount of money. That is just the reality of it. You know, and all I can do as a producer is just treat my cast and crew with the utmost respect that I can and try my very, very best to show them that I'm doing my best to give them what they need to feel comfortable and to do their jobs. But heck, I would love to raise 
above 250000 Like, I would love to have millions of dollars at my disposal to pay you what you're worth and everything. And I think the crew and why I continue to work with some of the same crew or the same cast is because these are people who realize how hard it is on the other side and they can think outside of themselves as well. And I think that comes with experience, humility from that experience, and having done or experienced other positions other than the one that they're good at, you know? So I think that's the biggest benefit I see for actors creating their own stuff is they realize, oh shit, I have to hit this mark. I know I may not feel like it in the middle, in, in the moment, but if I don't, then I'm, it, the frame doesn't look good. There's something behind my head, you know, whatever it is, you know, or like I have to wear this, this outfit that I look and I feel stupid in because it doesn't flatter me. Mm-hmm. However, I get it because it's for the storyline, mm-hmm. you know, type thing. It's honestly so, insane to me, though. Like, I grew up a theater kid. So, yeah. the whole like, it is an ensemble, just like film, it is an ensemble. You know, it is exactly. a collaborative effort. So, it's just funny to me that there are actors, especially who are working on, I'm assuming, like, these are kind of, smaller budget indie projects that you're talking about but that's what's wild to me that, that there's actors that are maybe have like this kind of diva behavior and maybe i should have better boundaries maybe i, I shouldn't put up with an outfit i don't like but I, that's your job is you need to be a problem solver and you need to be keenly aware of all the moving pieces and yes you have to drop into your role and you have to do what the character would do if it's like integral to if, if there's something that you're going to say in the script that like is totally counter to um, the overarching objective of the character uh, of the, of the role, or if there's something that like doesn't work, you're like, no, th- this doesn't match up here. We have to do something about this, but like hitting a mark, that's crazy to me. That someone's like, I don't want to move. Over. Like that's your job. I've had that happen. Learn how, yes, yeah, I've seen learn it. how to make yes. your character decide yes. that that's where they're going to stand. Like you have to be able to justify those things. Like, it's, and also, sorry, I'm just ranting at this point. But Please, totally go ahead. I, we do that a lot here. <laughs> I, when I was building my resume, when I was just starting out, the, the shit that I did to get, get the shot, do the job, you know, get the project done. Like, I was waiting around in, a, in Arroyos with spiders. And, like, there was one job I co- was covered in, like, uh, hot chocolate mix because I needed to look, like, muddy and just, like, I've done all sorts of stuff. And that's kind of just what you do until until you can graduate. But it's it's wild to me that I hear um, about that kind of behavior when you're not even really that established and you don't have something to really offer. And you can't, if you're making the job harder to get done, like that, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I mean, it's but not. I've, I've had that. Go know. ahead, Christine, sorry. No, no, no. I was just, just a lot of, just re- reinforces is, I've literally experienced that. I've experienced actors having a long conversation with me about why they don't feel like they, they just don't feel like, and and, and I, it's a give and take though. Like mm. it's okay to push back, but it, it, it's as long as we both mutually understand that we're just both trying to get what's best for the scene, the film or whatever. And it is a negotiation and it is a compromise. Then great, you know, but I think it's when you have this, sense of entitlement that you know best and and I'm not willing to listen at all to any other possible suggestions or that have zero flexibility that's the problem you know when it's like it, I had somebody once tell me oh, oh you know all we've been doing is compromising and I'm like but that is film that's, that's film that's, that's film indie movie. film yeah Indie film is all about compromising and the beaut- and it's a beautiful thing because sometimes the compromises actually yield a better script, a better, better scene, result. a better everything because it is a beautiful mix of all these different ingredients that are all trying to be their best elevating a story. And you can sometimes find a better story by being open to to being flexible. So we we have a few minutes. I wanted to open it up and see if there's anybody have questions for for Jordan specifically about uh her yeah, a l- little bit about your your acting um 
coaching and everything and and uh how how do people reach you about that um how do you t- how do you consider students um uh, what does your acting coach business look like i've been coaching for the last 4 years i started coaching during the pandemic um i coach one on one occasionally i'll do workshops where i'll do like self i just i've done self tape workshops i've done breaking into the new mexico film biz workshops um it's it's just kind of hard to manage like larger groups on zoom um i would love to start teaching a class in person though um i really love working in when i can um but mostly my clients come to me they work with me one on one um i have clients who are all over the map i have uh one client who's currently recurring series guest on netflix's new show pulse it's a medical uh, procedural that's filming in new mexico um, I've got one student who is 17 and she was waitlisted at Chapman's program. I think they only take like 25 kids. And, um, yeah, so she was called back for them at 17. I think she, I think her age was working like against her because she's so, so young. I waitlisted at Chapman. Now she's going to AADA, um, which is really exciting. And she was on A24's The Curse. It was crazy. It was her first job. Wow. Um, I was like, I don't know what to tell you from here, kid. Like, you have a scene with Emma Stone. Uh, yeah. Welcome to the biz. Like, yeah, nuts. Um, yeah, I have I have um, clients who are on Better Call Saul, The Cleaning Lady, a lot of stuff that uh, casts out of New Mexico. And I help clients find uh, presentation there. I do audition coaching. I do script analysis. Um, it's really cool. I have, I have like, 16 year old girls and i have uh, a client Dwayne. he's um his 50s started acting in his 50s he's indigenous he's he's native american um indigenous um i so i i've got people all over the board um but yeah so i work one-on-one um you do a lot of my clients are mostly coming to me for audition stuff because they're actively like they're in the industry um, but i also have people who come to me who are brand new to acting and I sort of create this streamlined system for them um, because I don't have, I have a degree in musical theater. I grew up doing um, theater as a kid, moved to LA, I've been acting like in classes at all different places. I don't subscribe to any one specific uh, process or formula really. My strength as a coach, I think, is I really meet people where they are and I figure out what's in the way. What what kind of impulses do you have? What are you shutting down? How do we create a system and build out a toolbox that works for you and whatever role it is that we are approaching? Um, and it's funny because like depending on the material, the different tools that we use, it'll change, right? It's for me, it's really exciting to figure out um, how to crack the code and break the scene and figure out how to get people um, rooted and connected to these imaginary circumstances and. Um, that's, I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's but great. I, I, uh, where would people go to uh, sign up for your course? Um, how do you, like, what, what 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 do people have to do to get coached by you? They can reach out to me on Instagram or email me at my business email, which is desertbloomproductions at gmail.com. Um, I've been a referral-based business for the past four years, and I need to figure out how to like a public platform i might do like a website of some sort but i found that like the best clients really come through also right, people can reach out to me on instagram i'll hop on a call with them see if they're going to be a good fit we can talk about packages and pricing and what their goals are uh from there i'll probably have um i'd like to create some recurring classes that people can take with me I just to have to figure out the right um Great strategy for Zoom and how I want to structure those classes. So I will let you know as soon as I have that together. Awesome. And while we're at it, you should check. Your- oh, we're we're wrapping this up. We're we're ready to. Oh, we're ready yeah. to. It was, it's eleven twenty eight. We're we're trying to. I oh gosh, I just want to respect yeah. Jordan's time as well. So now that went by real fast. It did. It, oh, it did. Fast. I don't. Yes. 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 But yeah. I've you got- know, you're, I've got, a, I've got like 10 more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, I, I, 
Go ahead. Yeah. Christina. No, I I love listening to um your journey, Jordan, because I think a lot of people in the transitionary period, it's really hard. Um, I'm one of them. And so it was really nice to get to, it has been very nice to get to know you um, in general on this journey. And to, I think a big thing is just not feeling like you're alone and to know that we're all trying to grow. We're all throwing spaghetti at a wall and that it is a hard time right now uh, with the industry also being confused and trying to figure out what was, what's going on in terms of streaming, AI, and all these things. And I think the way to carry on in L.A. is to find your people and to be able to say, hey, I fucking had a terrible day, like, insert why traffic was awful and then like this person stood me up and all this other stuff and it's just like yeah i feel you you know and 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 being able to find people that you trust to not have to be 100 percent all the time i think that's the hardest one of the hardest parts about this industry is especially with social media which also helps though is is in marketing and there's a level of like how much do you you have to show the world that you're successful and everything is great and and you're getting hired left and right and stuff like that but that's like 30 percent of the time maybe if you're lucky the other 70 percent is chasing your next gig figuring out how you're gonna pay rent wondering why you've applied to or auditioned for the hundredth audition and still not getting anywhere and wondering if you should be in this industry or not and whether or not you'll ever work again. And so you really just need a group of people that you feel comfortable with being like, I have no makeup on. I feel like shit. I'm cramping. And I haven't worked in five months and I'm just glad that you're here and you understand and you're not going to judge me. And like you aren't holding me to this surfacey persona that I have to create in order for the rest of the world to believe in me, you know? Yeah. So I think that's, that's why that's, I mean, that's why we created get realisms. It's for us is to talk candidly and to show the rest of the world, like, it's hard, dude. It's really hard. You just got to keep at it. And as working, us as working professionals and everything, yeah, some days you do have it, but most of the days you do not. And um, you're not alone. And that you shouldn't, you shouldn't base whether you get into this industry or continue in this industry based off of everybody else's carefully curated social media presence presences yeah i totally i mean i I feel like oh sorry go ahead jordan go ahead no 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 I, I, all, all I was going to say was that it sort of applies to um even just on the crew side of it all right because like me working art department it's not it's it it, it doesn't begin and end with art, but it definitely begins and ends with the entire crew, right? And you sort of have to trust that the crew are going to make the better trip because there's definitely choices that directors have made or like camera people would make or or not camera, but like DPs and stuff would make. And I'm just like, why would you do it this way when we can just do it that way? Like it, it, these are like these situations that you have to just trust in the process and know that like, things will definitely work out. And I feel like that absolutely 100% applies to the cast, to, the, to, to actors, because like for, for better, or for worse, like, yeah, like, like you mentioned Jordan that you worked in uh you, you're a theater kid. Like theater is, is also like one of those things that like requires so many moving pieces and you got one shot. That's it. You don't, you don't have, we don't, we don't have the, uh, the, um, the leniency with film where we can just have these cuts and we can set up shots and we can, you know, redo or retake whatever and, um, you know, fix it because 
you sort of have to act in that moment and you have to just work with what you what you got. And I feel like that's even more pressure than film because you essentially are like like just just designated to this limited space and you have to work in that space. You can complain all you want. It's not going to go anywhere, you know. However, it is like especially with film, like I I do find that the some of the best actors that I've worked with would even have their two cents and ask questions. Not in a way that is like, you know, going to slow down the entire process, but like actually have an intention with the character that you are in. So it's like, okay, why in this moment do I need to pick up a fucking spoon? You know, it's just like, if, if they can answer those questions, that makes everyone's job easier. And instead of like working with directors who I've worked with, uh, would just say, shut the fuck up. It's just the way it is, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I've definitely worked with people who just don't really have that effort to, to really, um, key in every single person from the crew to lighting to to art to actors and really make this collaborative experience that much better because at the end of the day that's just all it is and and you even said it yourself it's like I'd rather work with collaborative people who who honestly like could could have these justifiable directions without like feeling like oh, I'm just like covered in shit for, for no reason and I'm just going to act my ass off and, you know, uh, be sticky and, and hot this entire time. And honestly, it's not even that far different from art because, like, I'm always sweaty and I'm, I'm incredibly uh, 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 perspirant, you know, to the point where I'm just, like, standing <laughs> next to actors. I've even had it, like, on one set. Like, there was an actor who literally, like, came up to me and she was very nice about it, but I was very inside of my own head. She was just like, are you okay? While, like, beads of sweat just like come down my face. I'm like, <laughs> I'm fine. You know, and I just like, I'm in my head the entire time, but we look out for each other. And I feel like that's the, that's the whole like, like thing of it. I mean, it, when you make a film, it's, it's like summer camp, right? It's just like, you are just, you, yeah. you're doing this with like people who you absolutely love and appreciate and maybe even admire. Um, and you you just don't really like get that with with so many sets and sure it can be a privilege yeah. but it's also like one of those things where it's kind of a given to just be like you got to be collaborative you got to be easy yeah. like to work with and sure that applies to actors but it also applies to like it's everyone I mean, it's everyone and and it should be everyone yeah, yeah. and and it and it, everyone's yeah. positions are are very um very important go ahead christine important yeah Oh, I was going to say, we had some amazing comments. Uh, Malcolm uh, Stroke said, it is all collaborative art um, from, and everyone needs to be on the same page. And we are all artists. If you can't give and take, you're in the wrong industry. 100%, Malcolm. 100%. Totally. I want I would go on a little rant here. Because yes. Please. I just, it's... Rant away. Okay, I think if you are, this is coming from an actor's point of view, I think if you are an, a storyteller, if you're a theater fan, if you're an artist, like you're just kind of this like sensitive baby who just wants to see the world <laughs> yeah. work. And I, I got into this wanting to understand other people, wanting to be able to safely express myself in ways that I couldn't in the natural world, you, you know? Um, totally. But what's, what's really confusing is the business of acting, the industry itself is like sometimes so it's the antithesis of why I got into this, which is like, I have a lot of feelings and I want to be friends with everyone. Like that does not, that's not the kind of attitude that really moves the needle forward in your career. You have to be like this strategic and very careful about how you relate to other people. And like, Sometimes, I don't know, like I've done a lot of episodic work, a lot of network shows. Um, the culture of those sets are so different than features or, I mean, like really, I would love to get into, oh, hi, Joe. Um, I would love to do more indie films because they have that more creative, you know, culture. Um, but it's just really hard to be able to like, to balance being this sensitive, creative creature who cares about people, who has um, the bigger picture in mind, 
and wants to be a team player, when you're on a deadline and you're working for a network and there's millions and millions of dollars at stake and someone's telling you to go here, say this, do that, then you're trying to just do the job and not get fired and like yeah keep your head down shut up yeah (laughs) yeah and 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 that's what's so hard is like trying to advocate for yourself Mm -hmm. yeah and how it's just this huge spectrum and how you show up on set and how who's watching and who's there and it's just really difficult to navigate and i just really love that we can come together and have these kinds of conversations candidly um and acknowledge that there are differences and and to be reminded that, you know, there are collaborative communities. And I'm not saying that network shows or all of the TV I've done hasn't been warm and fuzzy. Like, I've been on some sets that are lovely. I've been on some that move really quickly. And you're just a fair day player. They don't really care. But, but you know, what you're saying your is, thing. I think it's just going to be a constant battle is is this. You do, your passion. And then the logistics of a business. They fight each other all the time. They have different all motives. The they all they have different needs. And you're just trying to reconcile this all the freaking time. And there's no right or wrong way. There is lots of trial and error. And and the thing is, because there's no right or wrong way, it varies project by project. And sometimes you feel like you're sinking. Sometimes you feel like you're 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 doing it. And how you do it on one set doesn't necessarily translate how it's going to work on a different one. So, yeah. Why do we do this to ourselves, Jordan? Why? We're crazy. We're crazy. crazy. We're crazy. But if you still love film, after listening to all our stories and everything here at Get Rolls Podcast, uh, we are up with 10 minutes for Jordan. So... Um, I love to close it out and tell everybody to go check out our stuff. You know what it is. You know what it is. Getrealisms.com, ladies and gentlemen. Pick up your book. Pick up your hats. You know you know what we're in store for. You, you know what I mean? Get your education. Pick up a baby book. You know, I, I like to think I'm a baby man myself, and I would probably need a baby book as well. So mm-hmm. pick up pick up everything that you need. Getrealisms.com, ladies and gentlemen. Um yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan, for for uh, uh, coming on to this to this pod. Uh, we appreciate you. Open invitation, you know. Please come back and please uh, share share more uh, uh, acting, um, you know, secrets and and uh, foibles that uh, we all. I mean, it, that's the thing too. It's like that's why I love doing this podcast is because like we have all walks of life like come onto the show to uh, describe like their positions on everything. Even if it's like we've had lighting people, we've had art department people, we've had actors, we've had, we've had a lot of Rift. crew heads, grips. We've had a lot of people who at the end of the day, like you zeroed in on Jordan, that collaborative mediums are just, that's why we are in this in the, in the whole first place is because like we love working with people and we love working with, you know, talented people, of course, but like just, Having having all of these like you know uh, 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 people voices coming in and just like saying really like you know deep personal things that they they are willing to share about film it means like the world to at least to me and, and I listen to this podcast as well that like this is like something we all can share and we all can grow and I feel like that's a it's a we have a unique uh, setup here where we can uh, bring in like these talented people, including yourself, Jordan, to just like come in and just like talk about this shit. You know what I mean? Because it means the world to us. So uh, thank you again for coming on. And thank you audience for uh, tuning in. Um, Yeah. We've had some great comments and stuff like that. Thank you so much for listening. And we hope that if you're out there listening, that this gives you some sort of insight into our crazy world and why we do it and maybe it'll inspire you to go and make your own films jump on a crew Mm -hmm. take that acting class with jordan and uh yeah get into this world we're both telling you to do it but we're also both telling you don't do it i was about to (laughs) say really really love it i'm like if any (laughs) if if some people are going to be like i want to chase film or some people listen to this but i will never work in film So exactly. we we, we can have hate. all sorts it's of blocks of hate. life. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's a love hate relationship, that's for sure. But it is wherever you are, go to getrealisms.com and find us here on the podcast. And I'm sure if you have a question, we've got somebody here that can answer it for you or if it has has experienced it before. So yeah, go out there, make your own films, and watch movies so that we can continue to make more films. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yes. Um, okay. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Instagram. Thank you so much, Facebook. We're, 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 we're coming back. Tune in next time. Hopefully next week. We're not sure. We might be working. That's just the film industry, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We got we to make <laughs> our bread somehow. You know what I'm saying? So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, tune in next time. Thank you. Thank you.